Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Meyer Contact Notes, uh, the audio version, that is. I'd like to start off and introduce myself. My name is Randolph Winters. I'll be your narrator throughout this tape set. And before we get started, I'd like to, of course, thank you for purchasing this and your interest in the Billy Meyer material. You just purchased 16 audio tapes and an accompanying book with drawings and descriptions and so forth that help me explain some of the many things I'm going to talk about. But before we get started, let me give you a little idea about uh, who Billy Meyer is and why there is this tape set and what you can expect to listen to. To begin with, for those of you that are not entirely familiar with who Billy Meyer is, I should explain just a little bit about him and why it's important that you uh, really would like to listen to this. Billy Meyer, his uh, real name is Edward Albert Meyer. We've all heard many times uh, from people who have claimed to have extraterrestrial contacts over the last few years, and sometimes people say it comes to them in dreams, sometimes they see things in the sky, and some people have claimed to have gone to Venus, other worlds, uh, had contacts and gone on board ships, any variety of things. Beginning in 1975, a Swiss farmer named Edward Albert Meyer uh, claimed to be having contacts with extraterrestrials, human, just like us, uh, from his little star cluster known as the Pleiades. What was most unique about these contacts was that he started providing physical evidences much better than anybody had seen before in the form of pictures, uh, metal samples, biological samples, other witnesses, and these continued on week after week. He started providing hundreds of pictures, and it came to the attention, of course, of UFO investigators all over Europe who flocked to his home to see if this was real, because never before had we seen daytime clear photos like uh, this man was getting, and so, of course, it attracted a lot of attention. Billy's pictures, by the way, his name Billy um, is a nickname. It comes for his fondness for Old West heroes. He was very fond of Billy the Kid, and that's his nickname, Billy. His real name is Edward Albert Meyer. Well, after from about 75 to 78, he had uh, a lot of contacts. They were almost weekly. These were physical. Uh, he took hundreds of pictures, actually 1,400 pictures in all. He took a series of movie film. And these pictures and movie film and the information about his contacts begin to get out into the public. And it attracted, of course, people from all over the planet great interest. And uh, UFO experts like uh, Wendell Stevens and uh, Lee and Britt Elders and Tom Welch and Jim Delatosa and other people who were fascinated with the case began to work on the evidence to try to prove its validity. And over the course of years, it was learned that uh, Billy Meyer had taken extensive notes from his many conversations with these beings from other worlds and compiled them into what was called the contact notes. Well, unfortunately, these contact notes were only in German. Billy lives in a little place called Schmidruti, Switzerland, about 45 minutes outside of Zurich. And in that area of Switzerland, they speak German. And he, of course, writes in German. Uh, he does speak a little English, but, of course, all of his writings are in German. So he wrote down all the information from all of his contacts, which counted to about 135 of them over a three-year period, where he was allowed to ask questions and receive answers to all sorts of things. So all of this information uh, went into a stack uh, of papers that became called the Semyasi Reports, or sometimes they're called the Contact Notes. They comprise about 1,800 pages. Along with that, Billy has also written numerous books on other related subjects from his own knowledge and his own studies uh, from these contacts. So, unfortunately, that information, unless you read German, and even if you do, it's hard to get the books because you can only buy them from Billy. They're not published and they're not out anywhere. Uh, it's very difficult to get a hold of that information. This is uh, what led me uh, to want to go over to Switzerland and find out more myself. I became aware of the contacts back in uh, 1979, and I became attracted through uh, the books, uh, the investigative report by Wendell Stevens and the work of Lee and Britt Elders when they put their fine book out. When that came out, I saw the pictures, and I, something inside of me kind of clicked, and I felt like I just really had to know more about this, and I was very drawn to it. As a matter of fact, you could say I was almost kind of obsessed, I think, for a couple of years. I, it was on my mind all the time. Every day I was dreaming about it, and I felt so strongly, I was so connected to it, that sometimes I, I thought I was going uh, a little crazy. I thought perhaps I was you know, getting too close to it. I was dreaming at night that I was actually seeing Billy have his contacts, and the whole thing became very vivid and very clear to me. So I started writing, and I tried to get uh, find a way to get over and meet Billy and find out more about it. For some reason, I felt kind of compelled to uh, go over there. 
Well, I finally did, and I, I wound up staying at Billy's house. He invited me to stay there for a while, and I spent a summer with him and at the home, and he opened up his family, his heart, his books, and his information to me, and I, I had a wonderful experience of learning all about his contacts and getting all of his books and notes, helping him translate part of it in an attempt to get this information out. I returned to California where I live, and I spent some time, actually about three years, almost on a nightly basis, giving lectures, talks, and classes about all this information. Well, this is uh, how I've come about to make this tape set. Uh, since the information in the books and so forth are all in German and they're not published, obviously many people would like to uh, hear about this information and uh, read it if they could. So what you've purchased is a 16 tape set. There are 16 90-minute tapes here covering the information uh, from his contacts. Now, this is not investigation information. I'm not going to discuss at all any of the investigative work that's been uh, such a fine job done by Wendell Stevens and others. This tape set and the accompanying book concern itself entirely with the information from the contacts, and that's what we're going to talk about here. So thank you again for your interest in this, and uh, let's get started. As with anything, I, when you want to start at the beginning, go back to the beginning. For Billy, uh, this actually began in 1937. He was born uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, February 3rd, 1937. We didn't find out till many years later that he was actually one of four people that were born at the same time, and their births were caused to be born at that time by these visitors, by the Pleiadians. It wasn't until some years later that Billy actually found out about that, but apparently the Pleiadians had caused Billy to be born. They call it procreation, and they somehow manipulated and procreated, as they call it, uh, his spirit to be born at that specific time. Uh, if you're into astrology, you'll look at and find out that that particular time and day is the exact midpoint there uh, when we move into the Aquarian age. Um, the other three people that were born at the same time never had physical contacts like Billy did. Billy was chosen at the age of five actually to have the physical contacts and made his decision to go on with it. The other three people had telepathic contacts from time to time for the Pleiadians but were there primarily to back up Billy and to help him. As the years went by, they never revealed themselves, and unfortunately two of them uh, di died in a car wreck in northern Italy years ago, and there's only one left. And to my knowledge, uh, no one really knows who that uh, last person is. I, I don't know who they are, and Billy hasn't revealed that. But at the age of five, Billy's contacts actually started. Uh, it was on June 2nd, 1942, uh, in Switzerland, in the town he was born in, a little place called Bulach, Switzerland. When uh, Billy was with his father, uh, out uh, actually it was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and they were staring at the sky, and Billy had some odd feeling that he felt kind of compelled to look up in the air and look at the sky for some reason. A few minutes went by, and he started getting a very unusual feeling inside of himself to expect something. He looked up into the east, and saw this very large disk. It was about 200 to 300 meters in diameter. This large disk is shot out of the east, and it was very silvery in color, very bright, he remembers, and kind of slowed down over their head. Then just as quickly as it appeared, it shot off to the west just as fast and disappeared. Well, Billy turned to his father for some sort of explanation, his father uh, immediately retorted that he thought it was uh, you know, one of Hitler's new weapons. We were in World War II here, and uh, he thought that was probably something that Hitler had made. Now, he may have just been offering that as a, you know, some sort of explanation for his child, this five-year-old kid, without even thinking about it, because what had just gone by them was a large UFO, and obviously it was quite different than the airplanes that were being in, in, used in World War II. Billy immediately uh, was kind of suspect that it would be Hitler's new secret, that it would be Hitler's new secret weapon, uh, because he had spent a lot of time already staring at the sky and watching the airplanes, and he could tell a vast difference. But most importantly, he seemed to have some sort of knowing inside. Something happened when that ship came by, and he somehow felt very familiar and drawn to it. For the next couple of years, uh, right after that, Billy for, began to watch the sky all the time. He would go out at night and watch, and he'd see little stars that would zigzag around and move in different directions. And when that would happen, he would have some sort of mental connection, almost like uh, he felt something inside very familiar. And that went on for quite a period of time. 
then something rather unusual happened to him. He, at one particular point, he'd only been observing these craft for a few months, and some sort of voice came into his head, and it was kind of like someone talking to them, but there was no one around. And he was a little spooked by this. After all, he's only five years old, and he really just didn't understand what was going on. Well, this voice came into his head, and there were some associated pictures and images that also came into his head, almost challenging him to answer and try to understand what the pictures were about. Well, he was quite confused, and he was a little upset. He didn't know if he should ask his parents about this, talk to his father or whatever, but he chose not to speak to his parents. Instead, he sought the advice of a local priest. A uh, priest's name was Zimmerman. He went to see the priest and explained exactly what had happened, that he had heard these voices in his head and he you know, didn't understand what it was, and he was a little concerned. Well, the priest, oddly enough, uh, calmed Billy down and attempted to explain to him that it was okay, that the voice that was coming to him in his head, uh, he was not crazy, that he was receiving telepathy. And he explained a little bit about how telepathy worked. He explained to Billy that he was somewhat knowledgeable in these things, calmed him down, he also cautioned him not to mention to anyone that uh, he had given him this explanation, citing that the people in his uh, parish there probably wouldn't understand uh, his friendliness towards telepathy. And he explained to Billy that uh, Billy was receiving these transmissions probably from off-world from human beings on another planet. And he didn't feel too comfortable with that knowledge floating around the village, but it's always been very strange that later on in life, Billy remarked, how did this priest know these things, and why was he drawn to this priest? But he was. Well, in November 1942, not long after that, a rather strange thing happened to Billy. He was walking in the forest nearby in his home. He felt a very strange feeling inside of himself again, and again a voice and some pictures moved into his mind, kind of forced their way in. And suddenly he was able to interpret the pictures, and the voice was very clear, and it asked him to walk to a certain location, which he did. So he followed the advice, walked to where the voice suggested, and waited there a few minutes, and to his surprise, from out of the sky, this silvery object came shooting out of the sky in broad daylight and landed right in front of him in this grassy area. Well, this device, as he called it, looked like a pear. It was not your standard UFO shape. It wasn't a saucer. Billy says it looked like a pear. Out of this pear stepped a, uh, a man, an elderly man with white hair, and Billy remembers that he had him kind of silvery clothes, looked like a jumpsuit of some type, and motioned for Billy to come inside the ship, which he did. Billy didn't seem hesitant at all. Uh, it didn't bother him. It didn't scare him. He felt rather comfortable. He went inside of the ship. Uh, the man offered very few explanations, just uh, introduced himself, said his name was Sfath, S-F-A-T-H. Uh, went for a very short ride. The ship just rose up off the planet. Billy noticed on a couple of little sight screens inside of the ship uh, uh, that he was away from the planet. And Sfath explained these sight screens were similar to something we would have in the future called television, and that there were several of them inside of this, uh, and they allowed him, you know, to be able to see things and learn certain information. There was two rooms inside of this little pear-shaped ship. Well, just about as quickly as it happened, Billy had been returned down to Earth, and the, the door opened up, and Billy floated right out on the ground. Even when he entered the ship, he didn't remember stepping in. He seemed to float right in. Uh, Spath let him out, and the ship just disappeared. It was a very quick ride with very few explanations. Well, Billy was walking home, uh, very concerned about all this, was actually not confused, and he really wasn't puzzled. He just didn't know what to make of all this. He was kind of searching for an explanation in his mind. First, he'd been having these weird sort of telepathic transmissions and pictures, and now this pear-shaped ship shoots out of the sky, and he goes for a quick ride. Well, the Telepathy continued over the next two years. He, keep, he kept getting these images, and the voices would keep coming to him, and they would be challenging him to answer what he would try to do and try to figure out the meaning of the, of the puzzle, you might say, of the pictures and the things that were asked of him. Also, there were many instances when the voice would be teaching him things, open his mind up to new ideas, explaining to him things that were far different than what he was learning from his parents in the beginning of his school years. Well, about two years this went on, and suddenly something new happened in his head. 
He received a telepathic transmission of a different type, something that he had ever had before. It was the same voice, but it came in differently in a different part of his mind, and the images and so forth were entirely different. It was so different that it kind of spooked him all over again, and again he returned to the, the priest, to Zimmerman, to see what it was all about. It was at that point that the priest explained to them that there are basically two kinds of telepathy. We're all becoming more aware that we're both physical and a spiritual being. And the priest explained to him that on the physical side, that there's a type of telepathy called primary telepathy, which is primarily short range. And on the spirit side, though, uh, that there's another type of telepathy that he phrased spiritual telepathy. And this type of telepathy could be felt from very long distances far away. He also pointed out to Billy that Billy was very special and that he was able to receive this spiritual type telepathy because he could receive high frequencies that most people on earth couldn't. Matter of fact, as Billy became older and more developed, he would be one of the very few people who could do this at all. Billy's, these new images and these new voices that were coming into his head were an example of this spiritual telepathy that was coming from some alien life form far away. Now Zimmerman, the priest, encouraged him once again to relax try to answer the voice that was coming in and figure out the meaning of the symbols. This went on for a period of time, and uh, again he received a telepathic transmission to come out into the forest again, which he did, and again he was greeted by Sfath in this parallax ship. Well, this time the trip was a little bit different. He uh, was met by Sfath. Sfath looked pretty much the same as he did before, the same sort of clothing. The ship was the same type. It was not a round disc. It looked like a pear. And Billy walked towards the ship just as he had bef done before and felt himself just kind of float right in through the doorway of the ship. The doorway shut behind him, and he was kind of standing there on the uh, floor inside of the ship. Well, the ship took off. Billy was not alarmed at all. Sfath led him into the inner room where there were three seats, and they sat in two of them. He looked on the sight screens that he had seen before. He could see Earth way below them, and already they had moved up way above the Earth. They were 70 kilometers above the Earth. They stayed there for four hours, and during that four-hour time period, Sfath began to explain a lot of things to him, that he was born on purpose for a very special mission. Now, he's only five years old at this point, excuse me, seven years old at this point, Sfath is explaining to him that he was born on purpose for a very special mission and that Sfath and others had caused him to be born at that time. And Sfath had been even watching over him to make sure that in his younger years that he would actually uh, make it okay because he had contrived pneumonia at six months old and almost died. Sfath told him that he actually helped save him from pneumonia and uh, help ensure the mission that the purpose today was to explain to him what his life would be like and a little bit about his mission because Billy was going to have to make a decision right there and then if he was to go on with this particular mission. It seems that they didn't want to force it upon him, but of course they'd already caused him to be born. They'd already sent him the telepathic messages without his, without his uh, permission. He had already had two years of telepathic uh, feelings, images, and these sight things and pictures that come into his mind. And so now at the age of seven, they were asking him if he would want to continue on in this capacity and if he wanted to learn a lot more. And if he did, that his lifetime would be filled actually with a lot of hardship, a lot of very difficult times because of the role that he'd be taking on. Billy uh, felt very comfortable with this for some reason. Actually, even at that age, he felt like he had it was a responsibility, something that he needed to do, and he decided to go ahead with it. He also, at the age of seven, was probably kind of fascinated by this man and this ship and all that was going on, and could also probably have seen Brother Childlike to him, like, of course, let's play. So uh, at any point, he, he went on with it. During those four hours, Spath explained a lot of other things to him, knowledges about telepathy and meditation and life and what the universe was all about. A lot of things were transmitted to Billy. Towards the end of that, Sfath uh, set him down in a chair and put some sort of device on his head. And when he turned the device on, Billy said that suddenly inside of his thoughts, inside of his mind, suddenly most anything that he wanted to know would come to him. He was kind of overcome with a feeling of well-being, like he wanted to help people, cure other people. He could suddenly think of the future and see projections. Uh, he felt very prophetic, very clairvoyant. Something had been done to him to really stimulate his mind. It's quite possible at this point something had been done in his mind to alter it. 
perhaps even grow extra neurons to store information. Later, we're going to learn, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, how information and wisdom from your spirit is stored in the brain. And we'll see that at the age of seven, this is probably what was done to Billy. Well, after the device was taken off, uh, Svath explained to them that the knowledges and things that he had now learned and been exposed to would now become a part of him that they had been opened up into his thoughts, and they would now be, you know, uh, his knowledges forever. Something else had also been done. Some sort of block had been put into his mind so that if someone else tried to pry into his thoughts, either telepathically, hypnotically, or whatever, or drug inducement of some type, that there was a block put into his thoughts so that couldn't happen. In other words, his knowledges were being protected. Svath went on to explain a little bit more about his mission, uh, by the way, when this is happening now, this is the summer of 1944. And he explains to Billy that in the following year, August of 1945, remember World War II is on, that an event not unlike Sodom and Gomorrah would happen, but it would happen in Japan. And this was the event of Hiroshima and Nagasaki where we, in August of 80, uh, August of 45, the bombs were dropped. This was one of the first prophetic things that the ETs began to tell Billy about. Okay. Well, after that four hours, uh, Billy was returned down to Earth. Uh, he never saw Svath again. The telepathic contacts continued throughout his younger years. He was only seven there. And on his 16th birthday, February 3rd, on his 16th birthday, was the last time he heard from Svath. Svath's voice came into his head at that time on his birthday. It was very weak, very old, and kind of feeble sounding, but he'd grown quite accompanied to it at that point. The voice died out and disappeared, and that was the last time he ever heard from him. It was only a couple hours after that that a new voice came into his head. The new voice had a feminine sound. The new voice said that her name was Ascot, and that she would be taking over his education. She knew Svath very well, and that from now on, she would be coming into his thoughts, and his education now would be stepped up. Apparently, she was far more advanced than this man's fath was, and now that Billy was older and his younger education had kind of had a, a basic ground uh, lay now, it would be possible for her to introduce him to many new wonders. She told him that they would be going uh, on time travel, they'd be going to other worlds, and many experiences that would help with his education. Now, remember, this is only 16. In the contact notes... Uh, the information about his travels with Ascot and so forth aren't down till several books off into it. And I'm going to try to kind of present the information in kind of the same uh, time frame as they happen in the contact notes. So I'm going to skip uh, on down and go into his other contacts with the Pleiadians. And we'll come back later on and I'll tell you more and more about his years with Ascot and those particular contacts. But just to give you a brief idea... Those contacts were telepathic, started at 16. He had several physical contacts with her, uh, time traveling, like I did mention, and to different time frames and different experiences. Uh, he traveled for, through India and other countries and wound up back home when he was 27 with his wife, Poppy. And it wasn't until January, uh, much later in 1975, on January 28th, when his contacts then began with the Pleiadians. Up to this point, uh, Ascot was not a Pleiadian. She was from another race. So uh, at this point, we pick up and we move up to January 28th, uh, 1945, when very unexpectedly, Billy's first contact with the Pleiadians began. I say unexpectedly because uh, even though he was told that he was going to have the contacts later in life, he wasn't expecting them then. He was told they wouldn't start until a year after that. So he was quite surprised one afternoon when he was working out on the farm uh, when he felt this peculiar sensation come into him again. Some thoughts were forcing their way into him, and he was a little surprised because, like I said, he wasn't expecting it. Well, this new voice came in and uh, introduced herself. It was a female voice again. And new images and new pictures came into his mind, which he had learned to interpret over the years. He knew what these symbols and pictures meant. He knew they were coming, and he was being directed to get on his moped, bring his camera, and she was directing him to a particular site. He was about to have his first contact with a new teacher. Well, Billy hops on his moped and proceeds to follow the information that's coming to him and his thoughts. And it turns out he's got quite a ride to go. Uh, he starts riding through his local village, 
and people are looking out the window and watching him. And Billy has already earned a reputation around, you know, for being a rather unique person just throughout his childhood and his teens and so forth, always having these strange experiences and missing so much and being thought of as kind of a troublemaker. He already had, uh, you know, kind of rather odd looks from people when he would drive through the village. Today, if they only knew what he was going to, they would really have some interesting looks for him because he's on his way out for his first contact. The telepathic transmissions that come into him, he keeps feeling this cooling sensation on his forehead, by the way, that always lets him know that thoughts are going to be coming from them. He drives his moped out, and he's actually almost an hour away before he gets to the location that he's been led to. When he gets there, he gets off his moped, and he notices that there's a truck on the other side of the road, just parked the side of the road. Apparently, who's ever driving the truck had wandered off into the forest. It was a German truck, judging from the license plate. Billy waited a few minutes, and he had his camera with him. And then he felt something was about to happen, which it did. Uh, it only took a minute or two, and this silver disc-like object appeared, comes swooping down out of the sky, completely quiet, and was floating just a couple hundred meters behind the truck over the trees. Well, Billy grabbed a picture real fast. He knew from previous experience that these things move very quickly and usually disappear, and it was very hard to get a picture of them. So he snapped a picture right away as fast as he could before it disappeared. The ship floated around a little bit and then kept moving away and uh, a little farther down the road. Billy snapped another picture. Then suddenly the ship kind of shot away. Billy got on his moped. He was again led to move down the road, which he did uh, a few hundred yards down the road. Parked his moped again and noticed down the road that the, uh, the German truck was moving away and he was now left alone out here in the forest. Uh, he noticed a minute or two later that the birds were taking flight. Animals all over were, you know, somehow sensing something was going to happen, and they took off. Well, the silver disc reappeared, and this time it came down very gently and sat down on the ground. Well, Billy snapped another picture of it and started walking towards it. He said in his own words he was feeling rather cheeky, and he was very comfortable about this. He was actually getting kind of excited. He started walking towards the ship trying to take another picture. He only got about 100 meters from the ship, and suddenly he couldn't get any closer. Uh, he was, his progress was blocked by some unseen force. Some sort of energy around the ship was keeping him from getting any closer, and he couldn't move in. It was very gentle. He said it was like wind. You would move in. You didn't feel wind, but you just couldn't go any farther. It was just pushing back very gently. So he sat down underneath the tree and wait, because uh, he was quite sure that someone would come out of the ship, and they did. It was only about a minute, and he noticed someone coming from behind the ship and walking towards him. He immediately noticed their clothes. They had on kind of a tight-fitting type of jumpsuit, and he was quickly reminded of like an elephant skin that he had seen at the zoo. That's how he described the uh, clothes that this person had on. As the person got closer, it became apparent that she was a girl. She had very long, kind of reddish blonde hair and appeared to be a young woman, very nice looking. And his first feelings that he got about her were very peaceful and nothing haughty, uh, uh, seemed to be very pleasant, open, kind sort of person he picked up on. Seemed to be very pleasant, open, kind sort of person he picked up on this right away. Uh, and he was immediately struck also with the fact that she was very pretty and very nice looking. He remarks and he knows that she was very pretty. But she didn't, he says she doesn't act pretty. She didn't act like a woman who was aggressively trying to use her looks or whatever. She was just a very pleasant, down-to-earth sort of person. He was still sitting under the tree when she walked up. Uh, she extended her hand, which uh, he took, and uh, pulled him up. Uh, Billy only has one arm at this point. He, uh, on his travels when he was going through India and Greece, he had lost his left arm in a bus accident. A bus had hit his car and taken his arm off. So he only had the one right arm at this point. In his earlier contacts, he had two arms. So he stood up, and uh, they begin to talk, and she says, uh, let's walk over by where your moped is, and they sit down on the grass, and she says, uh, today, this will be our first contact, and I don't have time for you to ask questions. I have a lot of things to explain to you. And uh, she says, then later on, I'll allow you to ask questions at other contacts. And he kind of interrupted her and, uh, you know, as she was talking <laughs> and said, well, well, who are you and why have you come in here? And she remarked, well, for quite some time that her people had wanted to find someone uh, who could help them in their mission to make things clear to the people of Earth. 
On several occasions, they had tried to have contacts with various people, but it hadn't worked out. These people had either been afraid uh, of what other people would say about them, or they were you know, afraid they were going to go insane, or they just lacked loyalty and, and sincerity to help them out. But they had been studying Billy now for 10 years. It had been 10 years since he'd had any contacts, and they'd been watching and listening to his thoughts and watching him and studying him to make sure that they wanted to follow through with these contacts. She had studied him for the 10 years, she said, and she had gone to the trouble of learning his language. She was speaking to him in German, but oddly enough, it wasn't a regular German. It wasn't the German of his day. It was the German as it was spoken almost 300 years previous to that, in what Billy calls King's German. So they had a little fun with the language. Quite often they had trouble understanding each other. But she had learned this language somehow some, through some sort of computer uh, system, something like we would do when you sleep, and you would listen to a tape and pick it up. It took her about 20 days to pick up the language and so forth, and then she practiced with a language expert, and that's how she picked it up. And so she was speaking German to Billy. She told him that there were several reasons why they were going to have the contacts and several things that her and her people would like to make clear to the human beings. Uh, one thing, she noticed that uh, she told Billy that he was allowed to bring a camera, and she told him that photo proofs were going to be allowed for the first time. That for many years, people, different people had claimed to be having contacts with extraterrestrials, um, but most of these people were just deceivers or charlatans or kind of deceived in their own mind, and that most of them, uh, it, was, it was quite untrue. But for the first time, they were going to allow someone to take very clear pictures of their ships for proofs. And so she had invited him to bring the camera along, and that later on he'd be able to take even clearer and better pictures. There's a few other things they wanted to make clear also. One, they were going to pass on a lot of information about religions. They wanted to make it clear that they did not come to earth on behalf of any religion and were not connected to any. They told him that later on that there would be a lot of education about religions and the problems, some of the problems that religions were causing on the planet, because they felt that we were rather spiritually stagnant, that we had been misled by many different belief structures and religions, and that we had not, we had not really come close to the real accurate information about what was going on in the universe. She very quickly explained to him that there is a creational force or a creational energy that actually is above all other life forms in the universe. It is not a human form. That which we think of as gods in human form are also subject to creation, and that there would be a lot of other information about that later on. They were a little disturbed, apparently, that many people claim to be having contacts with extraterrestrials and quite often attributed it to some religion or they were becoming on behalf of Jesus or a god or whatever, and they wanted to make it very clear that that was not true, that they were not, becoming on beha they were not coming on behalf of anyone else. They just felt a kinship to us like little brothers because we shared a common ancestry, which she would explain more about later on, but they came on their own behalf. She also wanted to explain that no one else uh, that they were familiar with had ever ridden in flying saucers or beam ships, as they called them, and had not visited any other human life forms in our solar system. She even told him flatly, there are no other life forms in your solar system. There used to be in ancient times on some other planets, but at this current time that the Earth was the only planet in our solar system which supported life and that other people who were claiming that were just uh, making it up or were lying. Um, along with the religious information, they also wanted him to know that they were going to lead Billy, and they were aware that Billy already knew this, but Billy would be led to a man who had dug up some old writings from Emmanuel, the man who uh, uh, is commonly called Jesus Christ. These writings... Uh, had been dug up and were being translated out of Amer Aramaic and represented the original writings and teachings of the man we call Jesus Christ. They call him Emmanuel. Apparently there was no one named Jesus Christ. His real name was Emmanuel and his name was changed in the writings later on to Jesus Christ in the year 186. And they were going to have this person who had these old scrolls written by the uh, uh, original writings of Emmanuel, the Billy would be led to this man, they would come together, and the Billy would write a very good book explaining the truths all about Jesus Christ and the forming of Christian religion to the world so we would know what was true and what wasn't true. Okay. She also commented to Billy that later on that he'd be allowed to go with her in the beam ships, 
and go for on rides and so forth. He naturally had curiosity about where she had come from and how the ship was flying. And she did tell him that she was from the Pleiades, about 450 light years away, and that the ship that she got here in was called a beam ship. She remarked, by the way, that her name was Semyasi, spelled S-E-M-J-A-S-E. These beam ships, as she called it, operated on two propulsion systems. They had a light-emitting system for speeds below the speed of light. That's what they called the security band. That the, they could use these, um, this light-emitting device could be used within 153 million kilometers of a solar system. Beyond that, they had another system, something like a tachyon drive, for speeds well beyond um, the speed of light. Actually, they said that with the tachyon drives, they could break into what's called null time, where they could actually collapse time and space, causing them to fold into one another, and they could break into null time. And in this null time mode, that the ship could actually travel billions of light years just in a fraction of time and then reappear wherever it needed to be, that there would be more information on that later. But this, this was not an area that they wanted to explain an awful lot about because they didn't feel that we needed any help in our technology. They were mostly concerned that our technology was far in advance of our social development, then we needed far more help in those areas. So that was the basic content of the first meeting, uh, which lasted, I believe, about an hour and 20 minutes. And then the Simyasi uh, got into her ship and took off, and Billy snapped a couple of more pictures. And the contacts had then begun. One other thing that she did talk about in the first meeting, which I forgot to mention, that they brought up on several occasions was that we have to become aware here on Earth that there are many other races who actually visit our planet, and not all of them are particular friendly. Uh, she noted that on quite a few occasions, rather barbaric-type races would come here and actually see some of our own people and use them for experiments, sometimes even take them back to their own world and use them in whatever. Apparently, this is something that they couldn't stop altogether and really do anything about. She also mentioned that the time was kind of rapidly approaching when we could be openly having problems with some other races out there. Apparently, we are afforded a certain measure of protection by the Pleiadians as long as technically we're not able to leave our solar system. And once we are able to do that, then we're going to fall under a whole new set of rules out there. So that's a rather important idea because that's uh, these contacts now uh, since 1975. Now we're in 1992. So there's been several years gone by, and we're becoming more and more aware that there are many other races visiting here, visiting Earth, some of them not very friendly. An awful lot of people have been abducted, and who knows how many people may be missing or whatever. So perhaps they were quite right back in 75 in warning us about that. Well, Billy, after the first contact, went home. The contacts uh, continued almost on a the contacts uh, continued almost on a weekly basis, sometimes twice a week for a while. The notes that he would amass uh, was a rather interesting process. After he'd have a contact, he would go home. Uh, he would sit down at his typewriter, and remember, he's only got one hand, and they would transmit back to him almost word for word telepathically everything that was said on board the ship. And Billy would sit there with one hand like auto writing, typing like a madman. People around the house would even watch him. He can type like 60, 70 words a minute with one hand. And when he would get done, he would just be kind of worn out, exhausted from all this energy that would flow through him. Apparently, the uh, way that they would send it telepathically was some th through some sort of device they had on the ship that recorded all their thoughts and their talking while they're on board the ship. Because apparently, it would even stop if he made a mistake and replay until he got it right. So that's how mostly how the notes were amassed. They were they did this continually for three years where they would always send it to him after he got home. That way they were far more accurate and Billy didn't have to take notes while he was on board the ship. Well, the second contact was on his birthday on a Monday, February 3rd, 1975. And the contact opened up uh, when she picked Billy up. Uh, excuse me, this contact was in the open. Billy had not been in the ship yet. She complimented on him on his telepathic abilities. Apparently, he had been thinking about her very strongly and had a lot of questions in mind, and she was picking this up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she was complimenting him on his mental abilities. She was actually quite surprised that uh, he was as adept mentally as he was. 
And he was a little embarrassed about what he called the flowers, uh, a compliment. He called them flowers. He says, stop the flowers. It's very uncomfortable. And she was very matter of fact that she was just trying to not compliment him, but just state the facts that they were very pleased to be having contacts openly with a human being who not only was so sincere and loyal to their cause, but was such clear thinking and was so advanced in his thinking that he easily grasped the subjects that they had talked about and were very excited to lead him into other discoveries of knowledge because of that. She even reemphasized on that second contact that he should get the information out once again that there are other rather barbaric races uh, kidnapping and taking people from Earth and that the time was rapidly approaching when we may have problems. They seem to be very concerned that from their observation that uh, on Earth, uh, that we were very warlike, uh, we were not very spiritual beings, and that our planet was pretty much dominated by greed and power. And they knew that we were close, and uh, which we are very close, to being able to go into cosmic space on our own. We're not far away from that. And they were very concerned that if we move out into cosmic space as a ununited planet, many different countries with our warlike attitudes of power and control, that we're going to run into many other races that are out there much farther developed than we are, where their techniques are very developed, and where they would have no second thoughts at all about either enslaving our planet or nuking this planet altogether, and they want us to be very aware of that, that we're not going to be able to get away with these very barbaric attitudes we have here on Earth. You have only to think about the evening news that you watch every day about our planet, and notice the many wars going on all over our planet, which are both caused by, instituted, and controlled by greed and power, mostly. Uh, this need that most of our leaders seem to have to dominate and be important, this great ego thing that so many of them have. Well, they're very concerned about is going out into open space with us. So that, was kind of, that came up again on the second contact. Um, they had mentioned themselves as far as you know their particular role here, that quite often they do search for planets that are developing like ours, that are on the very edge of starting to get out into space, and we've developed with some sort of rational thinking processes, they then like to make contact with maybe just one person or a few people and gently awaken us to the concept that we are not alone and that we are not the only thinking rational beings in the universe and provide us with some knowledge as to our origin and what to expect when we move out into space. And this seemed to be the main thrust that the Pleiadians had in mind when they began to contact Billy Meyer. That was the beginning idea, is to make these contacts. Billy asked them why, why they hadn't contacted the government and if they were planning on doing so, and they commented that, without exception, every government on our planet uh, was not really interested in having a contact unless they could get a hold of the beam ships or kill the inhabitants of the ship to try to get the ship. It would just be simply for power. And they had no interest in that, so it really didn't serve any of their interest at all. One of the other subjects that Billy brought up right away was the concept of God, and this is going to come up in many conversations uh, as we go through the contact notes. But on this second contact, she uh, just mentioned to him that uh, uh, people quite often when they will show themselves on the planet, would refer to them as gods and would either worship them as gods or kind of fall hysterical into some sort of <laughs> spiritual fear uh, if they were to make their ships you know, known all around the planet and take over. And they regarded Earth as one of these type of planets, that there were so many people on our planet that who had fallen prey or they thought that their lives depended upon some belief structure or some god or some religion, that they would be so into themselves because of that and so closed-minded that they would probably just run in fear or hysteria if suddenly all the Pleiadian ships opened up into the sky. Besides, they mentioned it just wouldn't serve their interest at all, and they really hadn't found that it would work very well in the past. Billy asked him also about age, that he said uh, many times people claim to be having contacts with ETs that were quite old, like millions of years old or tens of thousands of years old. And she remarked that, no, that's not possible, that as she would explain later, the man does go through a series of physical lifetimes slowly evolving. 
But when man has become millions of years old, say 10 to 12 million years old, that he would have evolved into a different form. And after that many years of physical life, uh, there comes a point where man evolves into being a spiritual being and no longer needs the death cycle and no longer exists in the physical form. So that no, there are no ETs out there, there are no life forms like us that live that long physically. She remarked that she herself was about 330 years old and that the life expectancy on her planet, which is called ERA, E-R-R-A, is about a thousand years based on our calendar. The four on uh, Saturday, February 15th. So you can see they're kind of close together. As a matter of fact, he had another contact on that Sunday, even the next day. And uh, Billy had a lot of questions at this time, too. He was concerned again, and he was asking about the beam ships, uh, you know, how they could travel and how long it took for her to get here. And she remarked that it was seven hours travel time for her to get here to see Billy uh, in her little beam ship. And basically how that worked, and she reiterated again that the ships have two drive systems. They have a light emitting system uh, that's used for sublight speeds. And that when the ship reaches speeds uh, at the speed of light or slightly above, that the ship is converted into another form and other drive systems are used. And that she felt that uh, she really shouldn't go into that any farther. But she did tell Billy that at that time, even in 75, that some of our scientists had already been playing with the concepts and ideas of these kinds of drives. And it was starting to emerge a little bit in our own science. But she didn't want to help them out any farther by explaining that. She did tell Billy that the shape of the ship really wasn't important, that they used these saucer-type ships on planets where there was atmosphere or water, or when they had these old beam ship-type drive systems in it, because the large surface area helped uh, make the drive system most effective. She commented that the shape of the ship, of these flying saucers, the saucer-type ship, uh, they, they were using it on purpose for these contacts because the shape of that ship would seem friendly or kind of comfortable to many of us. She was going to explain later on, she said something about the heritage and the history uh, of many of us where some of us may have originated on other systems where we had in our previous lives already come in contact with ships of that same design and shape, so it would feel very comfortable to us. But she remarked that many of their flying devices were of all kinds of unusual shapes and weren't necessarily in the saucer shape. It was just something. I'm going to just stop right down here because we're going to have to flip the tape over, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, we're back. We're on side two here. We were just talking about the beam ships and the comfortable shape of the flying saucer that uh, that they were using. Later on in 1981, Billy's going to take some uh, pictures of another ship that's an experimental craft that looks quite different. And over the years, it's proved to be uncomfortable, people. It's been challenged more than any other picture, so perhaps they were right. Um, a couple of the things I might want to mention about the beam ship that uh, came up here was this, what they call the safety or security thing that, again, they reiterated, and maybe they're dropping some clues here, that the light emitting device that they use for the uh, slower drives is used uh, within a range of 153 million kilometers of a solar system. They were commenting that this was important because they had already learned that if they try to accelerate into these with these tachyon drives or these faster than light uh, travel propulsion systems if they're closer to a solar system than 153 million kilometers that quite often it can disturb the orbit of the solar system quite often it can throw comets out of their orbit or cause you know asteroids and things to go a different direction so it can be a destabilizing factor to the natural orbit of you know bodies moving in a solar system so they've learned to never accelerate or make these hyperspace jumps closer than 153 million kilometers to a solar system. It took her seven hours to get to the Pleiades where she lived because it takes them over three hours to fly out of our solar system at the slower speeds. And once they get past this security area, they call this 153 million kilometers, they then accelerate the ship. 
The energy screens around the ship protect it from the mass speed correlation so it's not crushed. Once the ship attains speeds at the speed of light or beyond at some point, the tremendous pressures of the mass speed correlation of space pressing in on the ship are used to facilitate some sort of compression method where the ship is actually converted to another form. She says it's something like a thought form into particles that exist beyond the speed of light. These particles are then programmed for the destination that they need to go. They then reappear at that destination. Say, for instance, they're going to the Pleiades. They go to the Pleiadian area. The ship then is transferred back into its material form, and then it slows down and flies for three hours into the Pleiades. The actual time that the jump or the in null time, I uh, says, is just a part second. That actually there is some time transfers, uh, transpires, but it's very short indeed. So for the most part, the entire seven hours is spent speeding up out of the solar system and slowing down flying into the other solar system. Now, on many occasions, Semyasi had to come all the way from the Pleiades, but as the contacts continued, on many cases, she stayed on Earth for quite a period of time, living at one of their underground facilities in the Switzerland area. They had one there, one in Russia, and they did build one in the southwestern part of the United States. And on some times, she would stay on board some of their very large ships, which they call great spacers. We call them mother ships sometimes. But on uh, some occasions, she did have to fly all the way from the Pleiades, and she regarded that as a very long trip. That's uh, something very different for us, to take seven hours to go 450 light years and think of that as a long trip. I suppose that's like if you got in your car in Los Angeles and drove to Colorado Springs or Chicago or something. You would think that was a very long, you know, uh, grueling trip, so they probably regard that as much the same. By the way, in your accompanying book that comes with this uh, audio tape set, Exhibit 1, there's a little drawing you can refer to at this point, and it has a little diagram there of the beam ship breaking into hyperspace and flying over to the planet Earth. So you might want to refer to that. On the fifth contact, which was Sunday, uh, February 16th, 1975, just one day later, there was another contact. And in this particular contact, uh, uh, it was brought out, something kind of interesting here. Billy's writing a book, and at this point, they don't tell us what the book is about in the notes. He's writing a book about something, and they're very excited to see that he's writing the book because it contains some truthful knowledge that's been transmitted to him from some higher life form which they've arranged, and they're very excited to see this information get out into the public area. They are, uh, it says in the notes, uh, a little concerned because they think Billy's too anxious to publish it and it's coming out too soon, but they remark that they're going to leave that up to him, that it's his decision on what he does with the information from the contacts. So it's almost as if they're just kind of like, uh, you know, regarding this a little bit as a test, that they would feed him information, teach him things, and he's going to do books and lectures, and they're going to prompt him to go out into public. But these decisions are really up to him all the way through. It was on this contact that Semyasi began to explain to Billy a little bit about our own history. It seems that... Uh, in our own education, or these things that they wanted to make clear to the planet Earth, uh, they wanted us to start understanding about our origin, where we came from, and how we really fit into the family of man, and I suppose most importantly, that we're not alone, that we really do have some ancestry. The story I'm about to tell you, which is the beginning of the history that they related to Billy several times, gives us some real insight to where we came from, or of course where many of us on this planet have come from, and about the terrible history that uh, has gone before us and that we're about possibly about to repeat. So let me tell, tell you just a little bit about what happened on that contact. To begin with, they, uh, one of the first things historically they mentioned, because Billy had asked about it, was the Great Flood. Now, in our current history, our current Christian historians date the Great Flood uh, at 10,079 years back from that date. All the dates they gave Billy were from the day that they were talking. And so since he was talking in 1975, uh, they placed it at that number of years. But they cited that that was not the exact number of years. And that at that time, though, they didn't tell him how far back it really was. They just mentioned that in, in many cases, some of our history is far off. Uh, and I believe that the Great Flood is off about a thousand years, but it isn't until later on in the contact notes where they explain it again, and uh, we'll, we'll go back over it at that point. 
one of the interesting parts about the uh, great flood uh, was what caused it. Uh, the Pleiadians are telling us that there exists something they call a destroyer comet, a very large comet that passes through our system. Uh, and the back at that time period, the Earth had a rotation, not a 24 hours, but something greater than 40 hours. And we rotated in uh, a little differently. The sun did not kept on, come up on the east as it does today. So the Earth was a little different than we realize it right now. And that the comet itself had uh, passed by Earth and caused the, the great flood. So uh, at that time, there was great destruction. As a matter of fact, this comet's going to come again in the year 2275. They say this great destroyer comet that causes the, that caused the great flood comes by roughly over 575 and a half years. And it came by in 1680, 295 years ago. So we're going to get it back in the year 2275. It's going to come around one more time. It was the cause of the great flood when it came by. And... Um, that's what happened then. There was large amounts of water flooded over many mountainous areas, and then it changed. On two other occasions, the comet has come by, and that's what's caused the major change in our planet, the why we do no longer have a day that's more than 40 hours. Uh, the planet has been slowed down uh, to 24-hour day revolution, and that's because of that comet, and it's even changed the position of the planet so the sun rises now in the east. 3,453 years back, this destroyer comet came very close to Earth again, but something really kind of fantastic happened. Um, when it came by on that particular occasion, it was pulling in tow with it a very large other planet. Actually, the planet was about the same size as Earth, but most of the debris that the uh, comet would pull would be smaller particles. But it had entrapped some previous time, about 130 years before that, it had entrapped a, another planet and was pulling it. This is how long, uh, large this comet is. It's so big, it's actually pulling another planet alongside with it. Well, this other planet that's getting pulled along comes very close to Earth because the comet comes very close to Earth. Now, again, this is 3,453 years back. And when it comes by, there's a major loss of life on Earth. The planet, uh, the comet comes very close. There's a lot of loss of, uh, the comet comes very close. There's a lot of loss of human life and animal life, major loss. Many of the mountain ranges are shifted. Some of them flatten out. Some of them rise up. In the Mediterranean Sea, the lava walls of the volcano Santorini, the, in the, in the ocean, uh, the walls were erupted and lava spewed out into the ocean. It tore that up very badly. A large storm uh, rising almost 2,000 meters is out over the ocean, tearing the waters up in the ocean. The floodwaters run in over Egypt and almost totally annihilate Egypt, causing a great epidemics there from diseases and so forth. The waters flood into Syria, destroying much of the landscape and the harbor cities there. This planet that's in trail behind the destroyer comet as it comes by the Earth passes within 600,000 kilometers and gets captured by our own sun and thrown into an orbit between Mercury and Earth. And this planet body then becomes what we know as the planet Venus. Now, it's not stated at this point in the contact notes where Venus came from, but later on uh, we discover that Venus actually... 8,000 years back, had been pulled loose uh, from its position as a moon around the planet of Uranus. And on several occasions, its orbit had been again changed by this destroyer comet, and it finally comes to rest in the location where it's at now. So that's how we actually wound up with Venus. Before that, we were the second planet. And when Venus came to rest between uh, us and uh, Mercury, it became the second planet, and now we're the third planet. One other interesting thing um, that was brought out at that point about the destroyer comet that it also had some effect on our moon. Actually, it brought us the moon. The moon itself is, this is a strange story, the moon itself is a fragment of a planet that's far older than Earth. It's 4.5 million years older than our own planet. What happened was, in some other remote system, they say, in kind of a remote section of the Milky Way, millions of years ago, there was a very large sun that went nova. And when it did that, it pulled into itself. Uh, just before it pulls in, apparently, they explode out somehow. 
and it pushed many of the planets and so forth that were in that solar system. They, it just literally blew them out into space. Some of them were destroyed, and fragments of those went floating into space. And this planet pulled into itself. It collapsed into a dark star. When it did that, when it pulled into itself, by the way, its original size was 11 million kilometers in diameter. And when it collapsed, it collapsed clear down to 4.2 kilometers. Now, that's, that's really dense. Uh, it's estimated that one cubic centimeter of that type of uh, planetary body then weighs several thousand tons. Can you imagine that? By the way, one of the, um, one of the fragments, there was a dark star in that solar system, a planet. They call a star anything that has an orbiting body around it. So if it's a planet even like Earth and it has an orbiting planet like we do, uh, like a, uh, a moon around it, they would call that a system. It would be a sun system. And they call a star uh, most any kind of planet. So it doesn't have to be even a gaseous body. There was a dark star in that solar system that blew out. In other words, a planet that supported no life. It was like a dead planet. That planet was torn loose when that uh, large sun went nova and it was thrown out into space. It was considered kind of a fragment. It traveled for millions of years and finally floated into another uh, system. When it did that, being very large and being moving very, very quickly from that explosion, when it moved into that system, it came by the sixth planet of that particular system, which had life on it. There were inhabitants, primitive life on that planet at the time. But it rushed into the system so quickly and the people, or the inhabitants of that planet were not that developed, they were not able to leave their planet and get away, that the destroyer comet came so close to their planet that it caused their planet to spin, change rotation, and actually go the other direction. There was large floods, and there was so much major loss of life on the planet, almost two-thirds of the life on that planet was destroyed immediately when the destroyer comet came by it. The destroyer comet then moved by the fifth planet of that system, but it didn't come very close to it, and there really wasn't much damage. It then headed straight into the solar system. It was headed straight at the fourth planet of that solar system. As it got close to the fourth planet, the fourth planet was so much smaller than this large destroyer comet that's racing into the system. Okay, You see, this dark star is becoming this destroyer comet. It races in headlong right into the small fourth planet, but just before it hits it, the fourth planet explodes and it blows it into all sorts of small pieces which blow out into space. This dark star, which is now becoming a comet because it's pulling all this debris behind it, uh, will later be called the destroyer comet by the Pleiadians. Anyway, it races on on its own path and fragments of this fourth planet that it has destroyed are blown out into space. Well, fragments of that... Uh, blow away and about half of the planet is still intact. Half of that fourth planet f is flung out into space, floats for countless millions of years, is bombarded by meteorites and other debris out into space, and slowly starts taking on kind of a round form as it keeps getting hit and goes through other things that it's doing out into space. Eventually, that half of that fourth planet comes into another system and is trapped by the second planet. And the second planet at that time of that new system is our planet, the planet Earth. That existing fragment of that old fourth planet comes into orbit around Earth, is caught by our gravitational pull, is pulled into orbit and becomes our moon. So that was the origin of where our moon actually came from. The destroyer uh, comet, which is what this old dark star has become, is still raging throughout the system. It's still raging throughout our end of the galaxy. And uh, again, like I say, it'll be back again in uh, 2275. The thing should be back again. And so hopefully uh, we'll have the technology, whatever. Maybe we could possibly even destroy it. But the Pleiadians remarked that that comet's been around for a long time, millions of years as far as their knowledge, and even actually relates uh, back to some of their ancestors. It's no accident that these visitors from the Pleiades are coming to see Billy. They tell us that we share common ancestry, that back in their history, their ancestors were from a different part of the sky called Lyra. And the history goes something like this, that uh, a long time back, about 22 million years back, 
the ancient Larians had come to Earth on several occasions and colonized here because they were a very high technical race and explored the, the galaxy many different times. Well, the destroyer comet on one particular occasion had surprised them and come into their system. They lived on three planets at the time. The destroyer comet had raced through their system and destroyed, almost totally destroyed, all the life on their worlds. What had happened was there was a, a throwback then almost to primitive times. They lost their technology. They were again back into primitive beings and took thousands of years again to develop into a new civilization. After they did develop back into a new civilization, apparently their technologies grew and developed very strongly. They then moved out into space, and they become a rather conquering race. They would take their great spacers, move in around a small planet, and with their great destructive radiation beams, they would just pulverize the planet and take it over. Well, apparently they did this thousands of times, seeding planets all over this into the Milky Way. Now, these are our ancestors. What happened was that after they had continued doing this for thousands of years, uh, their society grew to great power, great strength, dominating thousands of planets. Their leaders were very, very developed people who learned the ways of the spirit, the power of mind, to be able to link your mind up and use the powers of creation, spiritual powers. What they did, by the way, these great leaders, they were the kings of wisdom, was the phrase, in which they had, they had developed to a point where they had knowledge, such great knowledge, such great knowledge of wisdom, they had a word for it in Old Lyra, and uh, it's called Iwe, or Yahweh sometimes it's pronounced. I'm not sure exactly how the Lyrians pronounced it, but it's spelled I-H-W-H, -H, and it means king of wisdom. And to the Lyrian people, uh, it was referred to as God. And on the earth, that's what the earth people called it. A king of wisdom was a god. Okay, And that's where that actually started from those old Lyrian leaders. Well, what happened was, about 230,000 years back, the ancient, like the ancient Lyrians were going through a period of almost 500 years of continuous war, where the people were battling out all the time for their freedom because of the great cruelty of all of these you know, leaders, these kings of wisdoms that dominated their worlds and controlled everything. So what happened was, during one of their very violent wars, one of the leaders named Asel, uh, decided to split with a lot of their people. And what happened was, Asel leaves, he takes 183 of their great spacer vehicles, these very large craft, and there's 250 smaller explorer ships and about 360,000 people. They leave Lyra during the war and go off into space looking for their own place to settle. Well, what happens is they do. They travel for some period of time out in space trying to find some place to land and put all these people. They find this small planet, and they land there and they start building their colony again. Eventually, they populate a couple more planets in that system, and they're living on three planets now in that system. What happens is eventually their civilization is growing to new heights again, and they begin exploring other worlds. They detect... By the way, Asel has a daughter named Plesia, P-L-E-J-A. And after Asel had passed on, she became the leader of their uh, their society, and hence the name where uh, we're calling it the Pleiades. It's a hand-me-down in folklore from that name. But her name was Plea. Plea orders the ships to go out and start exploring again because their society now is rising up to great strength, and it's time to go out and you know look for new adventure. So she sends the ships out. The ships come in contact again with the destroyer comet, see it, and in the debris of the destroyer comet, find some remnants of one of their old home planets, Lyra, and they're following it. And what happens, but they come into the system where Earth is, and they discover Earth. Now, these people had never lived on Earth, but they found that some of their ancestors had. They found traces of old Lyrians who had lived here a long time before. Earth became like a new colony for them, for these people. We're 230,000 years back, approximately. Well, they colonized Earth on several occasions, but unfortunately the colonizations did not work out. Almost in every case, wars broke out among the different leaders on Earth where they would be fighting, and so the, they would come from the home planets to calm it down and stop the wars. Or in some cases, they would just take everybody off of Earth. There was a long period of time for several thousand years when 
Earth was considered something like a prison colony. They would deport people from the Pleiades and send them here as kind of like an outpost or something when they would be stuck here with no technology. Well, on one particular occasion, a very large culture was built up here. There was a raging war going on in the Pleiades. It's about 70,000, uh, excuse me, 50,000 years back from now. 70,000 people flee the Pleiades, and they've got a leader named Pelagon, and he's one of these kings of wisdoms. Okay, uh, He comes to Earth with all of these people, and a great culture is started here. This culture lasts for almost 10,000 years. And when it does, Pelagon is revered as a god. And this was the beginning, the Pleiadians say, in our own folklore, where the concept of God really kicked in and got started on Earth. That there were developing Earth people here on Earth at the time Pelagon was here. Now, Pelagon was a very developed, very developed being. Apparently had all sorts of powers. His knowledge of the natural elements of the universe and of nature were well known to him where things like levitation, telepathy, and so forth were very common. And the then developing earth human beings, by the way, he was very large. I understand he was 8 to 10 meters tall. So the developing earth human beings referred to him as the god. And that's how the concept of god uh, got started here on planet earth from Pelagon's reign. Pelagon lived to be about 4,000 years old. His society lasted for about 5,000 years after his death. And then finally... Uh, it fell into war, and most of those people left, and Earth was vacant for uh, quite a bit of time after that. So that uh, brings us up to about you know 40,000 years back in our history. At this point, uh, Simyasi stops this particular contact, and Billy's just kind of sitting there dazed with all of this. And she remarks to him that there's a lot more to this story. And that she'll continue with the history lesson a little bit farther on, in which she does periodically. Throughout the context, she's always adding on little different elements of our history. But it's interesting to note that uh, we have common ancestry with the Pleiadians. They're from the Lyra section of the sky. And that they were very warlike. It seems like we're following the same patterns of things that we're doing, that they were doing. We're developing up our technology. We fight among ourselves. We never unify and we use our knowledge against one another instead of for the betterment of mankind. And that the Lyrians and the ancient Pleiadians went through tens of thousands of years of wars and destruction on their own. The Pleiadians now are peaceful. During the reign of Pelagon, when that war finally ended, that was their last war. They seem to have finally come to the realization that wisdom is a better method than, than fighting and killing. And they have not had a war since then, and the Pleiadians have developed as a very peaceful, happy race since then. Okay, Billy's seventh contact was on February 25th in 75, so he's having several contacts here pretty close together, uh, sometimes within the following day, but uh, so far at least within the week. By the way, he would uh, shoot pictures on some occasions and send the rolls of film into uh, Zurich. And um, traditionally, he would usually take two or three rolls of film and just get maybe one back. They started disappearing already early on. At this point, though, Billy hadn't uh, really publicized what he was doing, and not a lot of people really knew about it. There was a group of people around him, but he wasn't really opening up his doors to the public yet. When well, around this seventh contact in uh, February 25th, uh, they were discussing uh, other UFO contactees. Billy was concerned that... Uh, other people around the world were talking about having contacts with ETs, and uh, he was wondering if this was really so. And he brought up the subject of Yuri Geller and wanted to know if uh, he was really a contactee. Apparently, Yuri Geller was uh, saying that he was having contacts with extraterrestrials, but uh, Simyasi informed him to know that he was not having any contacts with uh, extraterrestrials. Uh, he had not had any ride in the beam ships, and, but the mental abilities of Yuri Geller, he uh, says, were in some ways rather authentic, because he did have a certain amount of mental abilities, but the abilities weren't exactly what he thought they were. If you've ever seen a Yuri Geller um, demonstration, he would bend spoons, 
and uh, that's what he was doing, at least at that time. And uh, he was attributing that to his great mental powers. And Semyasi informed Billy that what Yuri Geller was actually doing is that he was somehow connecting with the spirit of the people in the audience. And he was using their spiritual abilities without them even knowing it. So he was somewhat, I guess, like a catalyst or a conductor somehow that he would cause that to happen. And he wasn't even aware of it himself. There was a list made uh, of different uh, UFO contactees like George Adamski. They told him that he was a fraud, that he was making it up. Uh, there was a few others, too. They mentioned that Daniel Fry was for real, but I don't think I want to go into that any farther here. What's an interesting thing to note that when Billy would ask these questions, she would usually ask him, what do you think? And uh, he would usually comment and state his opinion on it. And it was interesting to note in the notes that they're always flattering him for being right, for being so much more intelligent than they expected. And it was kind of a common thing. You see it going all the way through the notes where he's always getting flattered and kind of getting his ego buttered up, which was, frankly to me, kind of a surprise that someone that developed would do that. Either they've really been dealing with some very lowly evolved people or uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, the next question was about the different color races here on our planet. And Billy wanted to know, he says, we obviously have five. We have yellow, white, brown, black, and the red race, the Indians. And I uh, wanted to know, you know, if that was common throughout. And she says, yes, it is very common that depending on the sun system that you live in, that uh, that would determine the color. And throughout the galaxy and all throughout the universe, there were many different colors. Uh, there was even a blue skin race that lived here on Earth. And Billy said he was aware of that, that he had actually seen some of the blue skin race when he was in India. And she was surprised to know that. He did, she didn't know that he was aware of that. It seems that the ancient forefathers of the Pleiadians, who were the Lyrians, they had dominated many different planets, as we heard a little bit uh, about earlier in the history. And they had seeded many worlds all over the uh, our end of the galaxy. Uh, depending on which sun system they're in and the size of the planet, uh, these people would grow to a variety of sizes, anywhere from 50 centimeters tall up to sometimes 12 meters tall. Now, 12 meters tall, uh, some of those apparently had come to Earth from time to time, and 12 meters, my gosh, that's considered a giant. A meter is roughly about three feet, so you've got people 30, 35 feet tall here. So if a local Earth human being, if he's five foot tall and he suddenly sees someone that's over 30 feet tall, um, he's going to be impressed. You know, he'll probably get out of the way quite easily, too. The ancient Lyrians, when they came here, began experimenting with the local Earth human beings. And uh, this is where a lot of the unusual mixtures and uh, folk stories came from. Actually, this is where actually the monkey came from. The Pleiadians told us that out of the experiments that the Lyrians were doing with Earth human beings, they were mating people with animals and so forth, and that's where the uh, monkey actually came from. The Darwin theory is wrong. We did not evolve from the monkey. It was the other way around. They also created a lot of other mutations that we hear about, like Neanderthals and the Peking human being and so forth, and the beans in Africa. There's the phrase evas, by the way, means bearer. When the, Lin when the Lyrians were mixing uh, the people with the animals, uh, the old Lyrian word for a person who bears that uh, thing is called an eva. And uh, that's where that name come when they were creating Adam and Eve. That's where actually where that actually started. When they were mixing uh, people with animals, they came up with the Yeti, or the, what we think of as the Bigfoot. And that was uh, a long time back. When they did that, they were violating, uh, of course, certain spiritual and natural laws to do that. And they created these unusual creatures. Uh, the word Adam uh, in the old Lyrian language meant an earth human. That was the word they had for us local guys, or the earth human, was an Adam. And that's where we got Adam and Eve. That's where it actually started. They created quite a few of these Yeti-type beings, these large experimental beings. One of the interesting things about them is they had a very long lifespan, almost 15,000 years and sometimes. For the most part, though, they were very shy and kind of, uh, not cowardly, but they were just, you know, very afraid of things, and they hid out a lot, and they hid underground, and quite a few of them were killed. Semyasi told Billy that uh, even though they have a long lifespan, there were seven of them alive as of 1975, but she didn't expect that we would ever find any of them uh, because for the most part they hide out quite well and they stay out of the way. But it was this mixing of uh, 
animal and uh, human that the Lyrians did that gave us an awful lot of our old folklore and the Greek mythology and so forth. When we hear stories about giants and Goliaths and so forth, quite often that was nothing more than some ancient Lyrians that were quite tall during that time. Billy had a few other questions, and to kind of get on to another subject now, he uh, when he started his contacts, Billy was kind of preoccupied. He used to take a tape recorder and try to uh, get sounds of spirits and different things on tape. He was experimenting with that. And he asked him, Yossi, about this, uh, if there was a spirit's world and if it was possible to do this on tape recording. And she she made an attempt, and I'm going to get farther into this on a special set of tapes later in the series. So I'm going to touch just touch a little bit on what she said there. She said that there is no spirit world, as many people think of it, where you just go to another world where there's this material existence. You don't leave this existence and go into some other spirit world. She actually says... What it amounts to is that there are two types of matter in the universe. There is coarse matter, which is the solid matter, and there is fine matter, which is energy. That when a spirit leaves the body, uh, we are body and spirit, and when a spirit leaves the body, it really has two choices that it can do. Uh, it can move into another body, which it does sometimes, or the natural thing is it for it to move into this fine matter world. In fine matter world is an energy world. It's not a physical world that you go to. Um, normally when you go into the other side, into this fine matter world, uh, there are certain periods of actually even go through there before you return back in uh, to a physical body in this coarse matter world. Well, at least it was encouraging to find out that they actually do come back. Apparently their science has actually kind of figured that out and nailed it down. So there's some hope there. We are going to come back in uh, some way. Uh, if death is caused to an individual, like uh, early in their life they die by accident or they're killed or something like that, quite often the spirit is confused, does not want to, want to go into the fine matter world because it, it knows it's not its time, it's not ready to go. And so quite often that spirit will just move right into another physical human being. Now this sounds like a really strange thing, but there are more and more people, uh, even in mainstream fundamental psychology, discovering this phenomena that... A spirit, when it dies, does not want to leave the planet, does not want to leave the physical plane. It moves into another person. That person then is inhabited by two spirits, and obviously there's confusion of spirit. Uh, I know there are certain instances where uh, psychiatrists have worked on this, and through hypnosis, Dr. Edith Fiore's work in, in particular, uh, I've seen her uh, work on people and hypnotize people, and she's related countless stories where this has happened, where she's found more than one spirit in a body, and through hypnosis, she's been able to talk to that spirit and convince it that it has died, that it does need to move on to the fine matter world and move on. The spirit does. And when the person comes out of hypnosis, the confusion is gone and they're once again just a normal person. It's interesting uh, also to think that um, quite often people who we think are insane or are just nuts might be invaded with more than one spirit. I understand it's possible there could be three spirits in a body at one time. Bill even remarked that in many cases where we think that our people are retarded or nuts or stupid or something, these are just brand new spirits. These are spirits with no accumulated knowledge. So we have a few extra things we need to learn about this spirit thing. By the way, another little aside here, a spirit, as it goes through multiple lives and comes back, Simyasi commented that if you could see the spirit, that the face generally will always look the same. In the beginning development of any species, like in their first few lifetimes, most everyone looks pretty much the same uh, because apparently they haven't lived enough lifetimes yet to accumulate enough wisdom uh, and our face does reflect something about our character and the wisdom that we have. So in the beginning stages of life, when you haven't lived too many lifetimes, everybody looks about the same. She said also that it's not a good idea to try to contact this fine matter world, that for the most part, the spirits over there would probably be confused by it anyway. They don't know any more than they did when they were in the physical world. It's not a creative world. For the most part, the fine matter world is just an energy state of cogitation. There is not creative thinking like there is on the physical plane. So they aren't gaining any new knowledge and information on that side. So they're, they're not going to know any more than they did here. So you might as well just ask somebody on the street your questions. Don't expect that making any contact with the fine matter world is going to bring you any profound knowledge. Because you're just talking to spirits that have died, and they haven't gained any knowledge since they left. 
Also, they say it's just unhealthy. It's just not a good thing to even try to contact the fine matter world. And she remarked that most people who think they're doing it are not anyway. The very few people on our planet, there are very few mediums that really have the ability to do that, that most of them really aren't doing it. There are, it is possible, though, she said that... Um, there are some spirits worth contacting, and there are some things that can be learned. Uh, you want to be aware, though, of people who have maybe have been a medium in this life, in the physical life, and when they pass over and they're on the fine matter world, they would still have the tendency and the idea that they still want to be that, and they would still be trying to fool people or trying to convince people that they know what they're talking about, just like they did when they were here. And if they were confused when they were in the physical world, they're still confused when they're over on the spirit side. So that's really not a good idea to even try to contact them. Billy asked again about the tape-recorded voices that he's experimented with that, and a lot of people have, where you can turn a tape recorder on, and voices will appear on it, seemingly from out of nowhere. Well, she mentioned that sometimes... Those voices on a recording tape could be caused by cosmic travelers, people, higher advanced beings who normally use spiritual telepathy and or primary telepathy to communicate with one another or with beings here on the planet. Sometimes those thoughts can show up. But most of the time, it the voice comes from the person who's actually running the tape recorder, uh, which is a pretty wild idea because she mentioned that your thoughts as you're thinking can actually turn up on the tape recorder in the form of words. For instance, you may turn on a tape recorder and you're just sitting there hoping that it's picking up some sort of spirit information or something and you're thinking about something. And your thoughts, uh, which do not always express themselves exactly in the same words that your, you know, that your mind may do it, uh, could be going right on the tape. This falls in line with some really interesting work that's going on right now on reverse speech technology where we're finding out that you can tape record someone talking, play it back in reverse, and find that there are, they are actually speaking, their unconscious or their subconscious is actually speaking what they really mean on the tape in reverse. And most of the time it's a little bit different because we always form ideas and thoughts before we speak. And then when we say something, we of course usually tailor it or whatever to kind of fit what's going on or, you know, to express ourselves in a certain way. Whereas our subconscious mind is very honest and we don't have to uh, worry about our inside thinking because nobody can hear us. So, you may walk up to somebody and comment, gee, you look very nice tonight. And actually what you're really thinking is, oh, I can't wait to get away from this person so I can go get a, you know, a soft drink or something or mingle with somebody else at the party. Uh, but on the tape, uh, when you play it backwards, what's going to really come across is what was really on your subconscious mind. So this technology, if we experiment with it a little bit farther, uh, may be the beginning of some new technology which could really change our entire social system as we know it. Imagine if everybody had to tell the truth. There are occasionally some real spirit voices on tape, uh, just as uh, there are some mediums who can actually contact spirits. So she says it is possible that occasionally you do get real spirit voices on tape, but apparently I guess it would be really hard to tell uh, you know, which was really which. They can come from the fine matter world. And here's a clue, another clue into the fine matter world. She says they may come from different fine matter worlds or dimensions. So here they're using the word dimensions, and they're insinuating also that there are different types of fine matter existences, as if there are slightly different levels of it. Apparently you go through different stages in the fine matter world of kind of preparation or something going on before you actually return to the physical existence. Billy also asked about ghost music, if it's possible that spirits can transmit music. And she says, no, that's not possible, that it doesn't happen, that uh, uh, that's not what's going on when people actually record and they get music on tape. It is not from the spirit world. Into that context, Semyasi, when she said she was leaving, Billy asked her where she was going, if she was returning to the Pleiades, and, uh, or where she would stay sometimes. And she remarked to him at that time that, no, they had a base uh, beneath the mountains in Switzerland. And on many occasions she would stay there at that, that base. And that they had other facilities all over the planet. I know there was one in Russia, and they did talk it later about building one in the southwestern United States. And there was frequently conversations about something going on in the North Atlantic or underneath the ocean. So they probably have a number of places. Uh, and she mentioned that they are in areas where they would be almost impossible to ever detect, even with our good instruments. So 
apparently they're quite well hidden. Uh, if they had a base under the North Atlantic Ocean, I would think that would be uh, pretty well hidden. That'd be pretty hard to get to. I don't know how we would ever detect that. It was on this contact that she remarked to Billy that she was getting a new ship. She was going to get a new beam ship. The old ones that used the old wave principle of propulsion uh, were you know, very reliable, and they used them frequently, but uh, she was getting a new ship. Actually, this new ship that they had uh, had coming in, they were getting four of them. And she remarked to Billy that he'd be able to take some pictures. And in the slideshow, if you've seen my slideshow, I had these pictures where Billy's gone out and taken pictures of the four ships all at one time. And they're pretty remarkable pictures. Uh, other people have gotten pictures of the occasional UFO, but very rare to get four of them in broad daylight. So she got a new ship. And by the way, this new ship was, uh, had a little different capabilities than their old one. It had the ability to make a time shift or a time dilation. And she, with that, she was able to move in time and actually visit different time frames. One other group of information that uh, she gave Billy on this contact before she left is she told him that she had noticed that Billy had a group of friends around him that were all interested in this material, and she'd examined uh, their thoughts and listened to the, some of their meetings. And she was uh, not impressed, but she felt that they were all on the right track, and they were a very good group of people for Billy to be with. And he, she suggested that he actually form a group out of these people. And one of the main reasons was it for that she wanted to give Billy some information that he could get out to the world, to scientists around the world about certain things. And it would be helpful if he had a group of people to help him do this, to get the information together, do the mailing, etc. So she said, you know, for many years, the Pleiadians had been controlling most of the aspects of the planet. Apparently, they're involved in a number of things like, you know, the, the axis of the planet. They uh, watch the weather. They have uh, some sort of detecting devices all around the planet so they can monitor incoming ships all the time. She says, one of the things that alarmed them is over the past 60 years, they'd noticed a continuous breakdown of our ozone layer. Now, today in 92, we all know that we are having a problem with the ozone. There's arguments over exactly what it is or what's causing it and so forth. But we're aware that something is happening. Uh, in 1975, then Billy's being informed that for 60 years, they'd been monitoring the ozone layer. They were watching the rising use of bromine gases that were floating up into the stratosphere and dissolving the ozone stratum. And she remarked to him at that time that there was 6.38% damage at this time, that even that amount of damage would already start having effect on the life the quality of life of people and animals and nature on the planet. They considered this a dangerous level. This, of course, allows an increase in the ultraviolet radiations of the sun coming through. There would be three different locations, she said, on the planet where if left unchecked and this continued, that the ozone layer could get so thin it could actually break through and cause a hole in the ozone layer and ultraviolet radiations could come through and be quite harmful. And one of those areas was over America, one of those areas was over Europe, and one of those areas was over South America. So we're starting to see that already. We've seen the one over the South Pole. She did remark that one of the things that scientists aren't aware of is that these ozone holes can wander. They can move. Now, if she said that in 75, we've been aware of the ozone problem now for a few years on our planet by our own scientists, and we haven't seen the ozone hole move. And if they remark that they do control many aspects of our planet, then it's quite possible they're controlling that ozone hole and trying to keep it down at the South Pole where it's not dangerous for us. So the other thing that really surprised them was they quite often monitor a lot of thoughts of scientists and they monitor language all the time. They have these little telemeter devices that look like little small disks and some of them look like round balls. They're all over the planet and they monitor things all the time. They discovered that certain scientists on the planet, uh, being aware of the bromine problem, how it affects ozone, thinking that they could make some sort of weapon that would cause an ozone hole over a certain country, scientists had designed like a bromide bomb where they could set it off actually in the stratosphere, blow a hole in the ozone hole, causing these you know, ultraviolet radiation to rush in from the sun, it would then shine down on our enemies and kill them off. And scientists had actually gone so far as designing and building this bomb, and they thought this was just crazy. So this is why they were 
uh, remarking Billy to get his group together and try to alert some people about this because if you blow holes in that ozone, she said it can, naturally it would take hundreds of years before that to heal and get rid of those holes. So she suggested that Billy contact a, a Professor McElroy at Harvard University and let him know uh, what was happening and give him this information, which he did. Billy did send the information to Harvard, but he never heard anything back. So uh, I would imagine if uh, Professor McElroy ever hears this tape or knows about it, uh, he may remember that letter, but he may have uh, thought a little unusual to get a letter from a farmer in Switzerland about problems in the ozone when it was barely detectable at that time. At that time, several people were uh, coming to see Billy quite frequently, and this was the beginning of the idea of forming the group around Billy, which later became called the FIGU, which is a German acronym for Free Community of Interest in the Border and Spiritual Sciences and UFOlogy. And today we know there's a thriving group of 49 people in it. So um, that was the beginning of it. Okay, that's the end of this side of the tape, and I'll just fade out here, and I'll see you on tape two.